Denmark eased its coronavirus lockdown on the 14th of April by reopening schools and daycare centers. But concerns they might become breeding grounds for a second wave of cases convinced thousands of parents to keep their children at home. The rate of new cases is falling, but the government's decision has led to a heated debate over how to balance the needs of the economy and safety of the population. And joining us live via Skype is Dr. Lynn Marigard. Uh, good afternoon, Doctor. Good afternoon. And good to have you. How are you doing over there? I am doing very well um, compared to how other people are doing. Um, I am just waking up from a night shift at the hospital, so um, I'm ready to go. Wow. What is the update on the COVID-19 situation in Denmark as of today? Today we have um, about 50 people um, on ventilators. We have 60 people at the ICU and we have people, multiple people getting tested every day, but still more people um, are recovering and the numbers are dropping as you said. So, so far we haven't seen this second wave as you're talking about. Um, so we're yet to see what it means to bring those kids well, clearly, back to daycare and school. Clearly there are concerns there because if parents are saying, well, they're not going to take their children to school, uh, do you feel their worry is valid and is the government uh, likely to pay heed to their concerns? I think, first of all, when parents say that we put the children out to become guinea pigs and it's all emotions, it comes from a very fragile place because the whole point of being a kid is you need to contract as many things as you can so you can grow some kind of immune system and grow that so you don't get affected later on in life. So when these parents decide to keep their kids at home, they're actually potentially extending the pandemic. Uh, that being said, everyone who has been, we almost like a million people who had to go to work when this lockdown started, we all had to send our kids to daycare and school. So it feels a bit selfish of the parents who are doing this now because we, I don't have kids personally, but everyone else, they sent their kids to school and to daycare without any hesitation because we had to go to work and make sure that their loved ones were taken care of. Yeah, but don't you think that the children are vulnerable, uh, just as we say the elderly uh, people are more vulnerable to COVID-19? All the statistics that we have so far show that the kids are not affected by this. And a kid is like biologically supposed to survive most of these infectious, uh, these viruses and so on. So they are not, compared to the elderly people that we have been protecting for so long, they are not at risk. And the, the small kids that we have at home, they also have a set of parents who need to get back out there and get back to work and help build the economy and the society. So I think that people should definitely send their, their kids to school. And I think when they are worried, it comes from a, a loving parent heart. And I get that. But they need to get out there. And it's not like the, the daycares and the schools. They have taken their precautions. They are keeping the children apart. They are cleaning more, sanitizing. So they're also um, doing their part to make sure that they don't get affected as much, at least. All right. But we, we've seen in some cases, Lena, where bans were lifted and the numbers mm -hmm. started increasing. Are you worried that Denmark can face the same? Of course, we all need to worry about that. But at some point, we all need to open up and gradually start this process. I think also the, one of the biggest reasons for the lockdowns everywhere is because we have a healthcare system that needs to be able to take all these cases in. What we're seeing now at the hospital where I work at is that the people who have been staying at home, all are chronically ill patients, they're starting to come back slowly. So if they had come as usual, alongside with this huge uh, number of COVID patients, no one would be able to help them. The hospitals would have collapsed. So the thing we're doing now is that we have created room, we have created spaces, we have created special wards, we have moved nurses and doctors from their usual post and put them in these places so that if a second wave comes, then people are equipped to handle it. And at some point we have to open up. And it's not everything that's opening up. Um, so we still take it gradually and make sure that everyone can get the help that they need. 
All right. As a doctor, uh, what's the situation of fellow medical practitioners in the front lines? Do you have enough of all that is needed, you know, to combat this virus? I, f I feel like, I've, like we've had it all along. We've been fortunate. Um, and also because of this lockdown, we had had time to get um, masks and ventilators and like coats and everything shipped in so that we've always had it. We've had restrictions on when we could use different masks because, as you know, there's been a, a lackage of some of the masks. So we've always had what we needed. Um, I think for most people, me included, we don't do what we are specialized in because we have been able to move around and we've been placed different on different wards and on different specialties. So we're working completely different than what we signed on to do. And I think that's also uh, very important to highlight that um, all the, the people working on the front line are putting... <laughs> I mean, I've lost colleagues to this disease, so we definitely put our lives at, at risk. But we're also putting our families at risk every time we come home to them. And we work day and night. We work 70 hours a week. And we make sure that everyone that comes in can also get out of there alive. And I think we've had all the necessary means to, to fight it. So we're very fortunate here. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that you've lost some of your colleagues to COVID-19. Uh, yeah. I mean, some of the concerns, again, that experts are raising are the fact that it's important that those who are on the front lines like you take care of yourselves emotionally. How are you able to, you know, uh, do that, trying to stay safe and then stay sane at this time? I mean, for me, the, the, the easiest patient to get in is actually the COVID-19 confirmed cases because then you suit up to begin with. It's harder when you have patients coming in with different um, diseases, different illnesses or uh, emergencies because then you don't think about it as much and you can end up having a positive person two days after and then you've exposed yourself to that. So it's, it's a constant battle of saying, okay, I need to treat this disease. It might not be COVID-19, but do I need to protect myself? The government is saying, if you don't suspect COVID-19, you can't protect yourself because we need masks. We need to have all this all the time. So it is a bit of a mind game. And especially when it comes close to home, when you lose a colleague or you have a family member affected, it affects your mind definitely, but we all joined this. Like we all joined this um, profession to help. So I travel a lot in Africa, and I'm used to working with infectious diseases. And if you know how to protect yourself, you know how to keep yourself safe. So I try that. Um, I was not supposed to be in Denmark. I was supposed to, as you know, I live in Nigeria, and right now I can't get back in. So. There's also a personal aspect of me not supposed to, to be here right now, but I have to stay home and help the country that I was born in. Um, so it is a bit of a, it's a constant battle. Mm -hmm. 